Welcome back everybody uh, for our last session of the day here. We have moved from talking about direct mail to talking about decentralized finance. Quite the segue, I know, but this is going to be a super interesting topic. This is about the future of finance and the future of lending. And I'm excited to hear what these gentlemen have to say. Just a quick reminder, we will be going to overtime directly after this session. Uh, it's just going to be lendit.com slash overtime, an open Zoom session to talk about what we uh, what we discussed today. But anyway, without any further ado, um, I would like to hand it over to Howard, who is uh, running the session. Hey, thank you, Peter. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, this holds to be a very exciting session with some of the leading minds in decentralized infrastructure. And we're right at the tip of the spear here, right at the start of what could be the next financial revolution. And uh, I'm, I'm proud to be a part of, of the dais with these folks. So uh, let's get right into it. Uh, I'm Howard Krieger. I'm the head of valuation for the New York office for CBiz, uh, seventh largest accounting firm in the US. And I also uh, co-lead uh, our blockchain and crypto task force, uh, handling all the nuances that come up with the valuation of hard to value crypto assets. And uh, I'd like to go around the table at this time, introducing uh, the folks on the call, starting with Andrew from Ernst & Young. Thanks, Howard. Andy Beal, I'm uh, a strategy lead for Ernst & Young's blockchain practice. Thank you, and Adam? Uh, Adam Jiwon, uh, Chairman and CEO of uh, Spring Labs. Very good, Jason? Jason Jones, I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Centrifuge. And Stani. Hey, I'm Stani, I'm the uh, Founder and CEO of um, Aave. Aave is a uh, on-chain money market protocol with uh, uh, lending and borrowing. Very good. All right, well, thanks again, guys, for joining. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna dive right into this. So as it relates to the centralized infrastructure, uh, or DeFi and finance, um, I'm going to ask you each to describe what your company has identified as a top priority problem in this space and how you plan to address. And for this, I'm going to go dealer's choice. I'm going to actually start with Adam at Spring Labs. Go sure. ahead. Sure. So um, at Spring Labs, we are trying to transform the exchange of sensitive information among competitive parties. And what that really means is that we believe we've built a better mousepad for exchanging uh, information that folks want to keep secure or private. Um, and upon or within that sort of mousetrap, we've sort of developed a number of sort of applications that allow lenders and others to do what they ordinarily do, we believe, with greater accuracy, greater security, and at much lower cost. What does that mean within financial services? It means that we can allow financial institutions Finally, the ability to share sensitive information about their clients, like credit and identity or asset or employment and income information, directly without the need to actually um, go through uh, centralized uh, you know, data aggregators, in essence. So, for instance, if you think about the traditional give-to-get models associated with credit bureaus, uh, if our technology, you know, gets adopted over time, there's the possibility of creating, you know, sort of direct connections among, um, you know, lenders and others so that they no longer need to use these centralized data aggregators that both represent attacks, but also an attack vector uh, as well. So that's the problem that we're trying to solve um, through decentralized infrastructure. And Adam, a quick follow up on that. The re reduction in intermediaries and what have you. Is that a, is the goal to de-risk the system to, to as much as possible? So, so we think that there are a few different sort of objectives. The first is thinking about our ultimate sort of customers. So like thinking about financial institutions and lenders. They want to obtain as much granular information as possible to understand the linkages among that information or that data uh, and actually understand the provenance of that data. And currently, uh, with the existing centralized data aggregation sort of ecosystem, there's a disincentive for those centralized data aggregators to give you granular information or the linkages among that information, because once you have it, you effectively have some copy of their database. They can't sort of re-monetize it. So our system enables uh, much greater sort of data to be obtained and shared within the ecosystem. So that's number one, I think, and that's the core sort of selling point. The second is that it can be done at dramatically lower cost because you don't actually bear the full cost of the sort of the middleman tax, as it were, number two. 
Uh, and then number three, we think that there's just fundamentally better security architecture. So this information, again, can't be hacked in the same way that, you know, Equifax's database was hacked in, in, in 2017. And fourth, we think there's an additional sort of benefit, which is just consumer privacy, frankly, which is the information that's sort of shared within our network is typically a cryptographic transform of the underlying sort of data, which we think affords underlying sort of consumers, frankly, much better privacy. That's good. Thank you for the clarification there. And that's a good segue to Andrew. So, so Andrew uh, or Andy and EY, uh, again, original question. DeFi, what's your company identify as the top priority problem and how do you plan to address, and I'm gonna add a little spice here in consideration of what Adam mentioned about what Spring Labs is trying to accomplish. I think there's a good dovetail with you. Go ahead. Sure. So two, two um, kind of foundational beliefs that underpin EY's vision. One is that blockchain technology is the foundation for um, an internet native financial infrastructure. The second is that um, the largest public blockchains are um, likely to enjoy the majority of the market share. So those are those are two sort of premises underlying this. And and so when you know when we're thinking about how can EY um, help accelerate adoption of this infrastructure, we have to look at our our client base, right? And and the majority of EY's clients, uh, at least on the consulting side, are large organizations, right? So put yourself in a large organization's shoes. What is preventing them from using this new infrastructure? Um, and, and there are there's a laundry list of, of, of risks that um, that are between them and adoption. And one of them is is culture. And there's there's um, you know some things we can do to affect culture. We can educate. Uh, but culture also is a is a is a long term evolution, right? Um, but we can also address things like privacy. Um, large public companies are uncomfortable using what they perceive to be public infrastructure with complete transparency, right? And a lot of it's in how these how this infrastructure and how this technology is marketed. But if we can help take that privacy risk or that transparency risk off the deck by introducing cheap, affordable privacy technology, then that's a win. And we, we've done that in the Nightfall protocol. And there are there are other other protocols to, 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 to do that same thing. We've also tried to do it with compliance, right? How, how can we use this infrastructure, but do it in a compliant way? Because as a bank, we have our own regulators and they wanna make sure that we're following all the rules. So introducing token standards and other related and, and other related standards to make sure that these large companies, when they're using this new infrastructure, can do it in a in a compliant way. Um, so we're we're looking at those you know practical uh, sort of hurdles. Some are some are technical. Uh, some are some are perception. How can we take those off the deck so that our our large clients feel comfortable using uh, using this infrastructure? And I, I like the the kind of the dichotomy here between sort of the large institutional problems that. Adam, you and Andy are trying to tackle and then kind of fold it into this whole decentralized infrastructure. And for that, I'm gonna to talk to Stani. So Stani, talk about Aave, talk about the problem you guys identified and how you're using DeFi and decentralized infrastructure to address that issue. Yeah, I, I think kind of like one of the main things that uh, Aave as a protocol solves is, is that, uh, uh, we're able to have uh, cryptographic assets with interest rate. So, so as a protocol, it works in a way where um, there is multiple reserves where where users can deposit uh, different kinds of cryptographic assets, and and there's uh, another end of it which actually consumes uh, those assets. So, so uh, pretty much you can deposit one particular asset. Uh, earn interest and and draw another one and 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 basically pay interest for that. Or you could delegate it uh, that credit line to to some other uh, entity that can draw. So what's what's interesting here is that uh, as this kind of like a money market protocol, uh, most of the deposits and consumption comes elsewhere than actually directly from our users. So. This is the kind of thing what's interesting uh, from our perspective in decentralized finance is that 
uh, it's pretty much permissionless uh, technology in the sense, for example, as, as for example, Bitcoin or Ethereum itself, uh, Ether. Uh, and it's not just permissionless that you can uh, access it, but you can build very interesting things on top. Uh, so, for example, we've seen uh, different kinds of primitives such as uh, fixed interest rate models on, on top of the our protocol being built, uh, different kinds of uh, insurance instruments and, 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 and various financial products. So kind of like Aave protocol is, is part of this uh, DeFi ecosystem where everyone is, has this right to, to build new products. And the, the, the difference now is, is with, with the traditional world of how we, we used to build things is that uh, uh, whatever you're building on this, let's say the public blockchain ledgers is that uh, you can access anything that is already built there to, to, the, to the extent that there is this permissionless uh, interoperability. And this is very powerful because if we continue uh, the, the same path uh, uh, where we see this kind of like liquidity pools such as Aave or um, there's this uh, trading venue Uniswap and, and, and where you can provide liquidity and, and you know, uh, when we see this liquidity pools growing, uh, it kind of means that you have this pile of ocean of liquidity that is accessible from different parts whether uh, the access points are from the traditional world or, or, or some another layer in decentralized finance. Mm -hmm. So our goal is kind of like we, we noticed that there is different kinds of assets emerging in the space and we're trying to basically just put a interest rate on those assets and, and provide this kind of like uh, uh, money market savings accounts for, for uh, the users. So that's kind of like what's, what, what's our objective is. Nice. And I do appreciate that, uh, you know, having 10 years in consumer finance uh, and pricing is I, I very quickly thought about or learned to think about debt as being a temporal asset, you know, something or, or liability, something that happens over time and behavior uh, macro and micro happens over time and capturing that risk. And, and I, I do hear what you're saying in that money market creation as these new products come on. And I want to come back to that after we hit up Jason here, because I feel like there's some some conflict between the standardization and the DeFi world, uh, and I want to get your thoughts. And so, Jason, building on what Stani just mentioned, uh, in, in in what Centrifuge is working on, is is it kind of the hey the next level? You know, once you get kind of people learning to trust each other and setting rates, now we can start bringing stuff into the mix. Well, tell us your story. All right. So, um, Centrifuge is a decentralized lending protocol. And um, I wouldn't say it's the next level after Aave. I would more say that, like, like, like Stani said, um, everybody can build on each other's protocols. And we're building one Lego, and Aave's built a Lego, and these other guys are building Legos, and they can all kind of fit together um, to, um, to build, the, build the building <laughs> or build the, build the protocol. I, I, it's the money protocol to me. And to me, it's, you know, we're just at the next evolution of the internet. And the next, we've already built the communications protocols for the internet. And now we're building the money protocol layer of the internet. And it's not one company that builds the protocol. It's multiple protocols that are bu built that fit together and in combination solve all of our money problems and bring it, digitize it and bring it right to, uh, right to the internet. And like, when I think about it, like there's this history of of lending, my, my specific protocols in the lending part of, of the money protocol layer, my, in the history of lending is you'd go to your consumer, you go to a bank to get a loan, okay? And then back in 2000 and what was it, 2007, Zopa launched peer, the first peer-to-peer -peer lending platform. And then after that, Lending Club and Prosper launched the US. That was true innovation. Now you don't go to a bank, but you, you use the internet to get a loan from some, somebody else. So your counterparty changes from a bank to another person. And then fast forward to what we're doing today. Now, instead of going to a, another person, you're going to a smart contract. You're working mm -hmm. directly into the internet where you're asking this smart contract if it can deploy a loan to you based on your, um, your, your, your uh, variables, whatever they may be. So I think that's the next generation, what we're kind of pushing forward with decentralized finance. The other part of it is obviously the decentralized, de the decentralized nature of it. You know, you think of uh, Napster back in the day 
kind of rolling out a decentralized network of, of music or BitTorrent or even Skype, which is a decentralized network for, for phone calls. It's a beautiful infrastructure that is unstoppable, right? If you run thousands of nodes and one, nodes go, one node goes down or block, is blocked in one jurisdiction, it pops up in another jurisdiction, it's really hard it's really hard to take down the entire network. And when you're talking about money, you want something that is stable and secure, that's reliable, um, uh, uh, no matter what happens, right? And that's what the, that's the beauty of the decentralization part uh, of, of what we're building. So on top of that, those, those, those uh, on top of that layer, Centrifuge is building a protocol to bring real world assets uh, that are not part of DeFi and basically wrap them um, tranche them with the senior tranche and the junior tranche and then bring them to DeFi and put our tokens that represent these re real world assets into other protocols like Aave where we could potentially draw a loan and, um, and, and provide lower cost capital to, to uh, those asset originators. You know, it's, it's interesting and, and that, that's great. I love the Lego analogy and, and the, the buildup and I, I really do, uh, you, can, you can get that and you can see that. Uh, Andy, from EY's perspective, you know, uh, being part of a large accounting firm and whatnot, and per former big four, a lot of what they're after is kind of like the box, you know, sort of like define the space. And if you're in the space, you're good. If you're out of the space, let's talk about getting you back into it. Does all the, um, the ability to be creative and the ability to decentralize, uh, how, how does that, I guess, contrast and compare uh, to to what EY is trying to accomplish? Are you trying to get everybody kind of back in the box or are you trying to somehow create order from chaos or are you just letting sleeping dogs lie? It, it's, it's, a, it's a great question and I'll, I'll answer it in, in, in two ways. Um, on, the, on the finance side specifically, um, you know, to the extent that there is a technology that is going to fundamentally change how money moves, how transactions between individuals or businesses are recorded and verified, um, that strikes at the core of EY's business in particular, right? We, you know, so much of our value add to the market is as an auditor, as a CPA, as a tax advisor, right? And then we have this, we have an entire consulting set, right? Which is, which is separate. Um, and audit, tax, accounting, uh, all fundamentally impacted by blockchain uh, you know, it's, it's turning the internet into, or it's, it's adding a, an accounting layer to the internet, right? So now we can put finance natively on top of that accounting layer. So it's going to fundamentally change how money moves, how financial transactions uh, occur uh, and are executed and how things get recorded. And so for us to thrive in five years, 10 years, 20 years, we have to uh, not only wrap our heads around the impacts, but we also need to be on the the, the, the bleeding edge um, because we have to be able to serve our clients wherever they are on that spectrum, right? Uh, the the second piece is on the as a as a consultant, we want to help businesses operate more efficiently, grow, um, do things cheaper if they can, right? And so, to the extent that we think blockchain and decentralized infrastructure can provide a better customer experience to their customers, right? Or it or can help them run their business more efficiently, both of which are true. Um, then again, we have an interest in investing in that and making sure that we can bring those those solutions to our clients, whether they're in financial services or or another industry. That's fair. Yeah. So you kind of have to have a foot in both camps, you know, a foot on the leading edge and 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 the chaos, and then you need to be on the control side as well. Exactly. Uh, Adam, with, with kind of the mission of Spring Labs, where you spoke about uh, being uh, kind of uh, replacing some of those uh, congregation points of, of, of institutional data uh, and plugging folks in directly, does that mean that part of what Spring Labs has to do in the DeFi space is sort of constantly monitor the developments that, that companies like Aave have or Centrifuge or these other protocols? Like, do you, do you need to stay on top of all the new kind of coding and tech in order to complete your, your base mission? Sure. So, so with our technology, there are three sort of core components to it. There is a blockchain component to it. There's a lot of advanced cryptography, which really relates to the 
um, obfuscating of identities of institutions and individuals that's sort of what gives you sort of security and privacy assurances. And then thirdly, what we have is our client software, which really does a lot of the data standardization, tries to sort of create logic out of, you know, inputs that are sort of coming in effectively to the client software itself. So effectively, it plugs into, let's say, an LOS so that a lender can actually make sense of all of this information that they're receiving through the network. So. Um, in order to do that, we have to follow a lot of different sort of technology, technological sort of development. So, for instance, within the advanced cryptography, we spend a lot of time looking at, you know, things like secure multi-party sort of computation. We have multiple sort of patents that are sort of pending in these types of areas. Within blockchain, again, in our case, in order to drive uh, adoption with compliance-minded and highly regulated financial institutions, we are a permission blockchain, which means our utilization of blockchain's true potential is vastly lower than frankly it could be because there's a lack of regulatory sort of clarity. But we spent a lot of time looking at that sort of base layer of blockchain in particular. And as a result, we absolutely do follow a lot of sort of developments around various protocols that are out there, as well as folks that are doing things that are perhaps a little bit more orthogonal, i.e. around financial transactions, monetary sort of transactions, because again, where payments money and data, they all sort of effectively will sort of collide to, you know, Jason's uh, point earlier on. So certainly we follow everything. They don't have direct day-to-day -day sort of relevance for us, but certainly long run strategic relevance around how adoption or how some of these technologies can either be utilized or leveraged and or can come together is definitely something we spend uh, spend time thinking about, of course. That's fair. Totally. And Stani, to kind of build on, on Adam's comments about Kind of keeping an eye on things and seeing how they evolve. Now, in in the Ave world, you 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 had this this really great description of the fact that you you, you kind of create a space for developers to be creative and to create creative uses for the technology. Does that kind of put you in the position of okay, if 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 things are are working here at home and people are developing protocols on top of our system? Now my role is to now look out at the regulatory and compliance and, and, and all and, and try to try to influence or or uh, help kind of craft some of the compliance and, and regulatory infrastructure built around uh, decentralized finance to sort of to, to keep the the creative space uh, unimpaired by regulatory and, and, and compliance rules which, which may kind of be out of line with the tech. Yeah, it is kind of like a, a challenging I, because I, I think the the the, the component of, of building things and building products and 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 having them as as decentralized as possible is 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 working pretty well. What what is kind of missing is is clear guidance on regulation, and this is like a global uh, challenge in 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 kind of like one sense. And I, I think for us, it's it's very important that. Uh, like the, the protocols are uh, sufficiently uh, decentralized, and you know it's very difficult to use like decentralized, be decentralized finance without actually being enough uh, decentralized that it actually is the the situation, or or have this journey in your uh, roadmap. And I, I think like we spend quite some time in terms of like the uh, uh, regulatory uh, compliance in this and and strategy. I mean. Personally, I'm, I'm myself uh, with a legal background, and we recently at Aave we received a uh, electronic money license uh, within the UK, and and mainly for the reason that uh, we understand that the, the the protocols itself, like Ethereum protocol, uh, the the Bitcoin protocol, and DeFi protocols, are autonomous protocols that run in decentralized ecosystem. But end of the day, uh, those access points into this uh, these systems. Uh, might take custody or or might not, but they are basically providing access, and they might have to have some sort of a uh, regulation in, in that sense. And and basically, uh, that uh, work that we have done and and uh, received the license is actually related uh, to onboarding more people uh, into the space and providing the the access into uh, DeFi. But I think there is a more bigger question about like self regulation in the sense that. If the space doesn't uh, suffer from kind of like from its own success in in the sense that let's say if there's constant hacks and, and constant let's say bugs and people are losing money uh, then people need protection any kind of a user whether it's a robot uh, or a real human being that is interacting 
uh, needs kind of then regulation. So there's a lot of responsibility in the industry itself. And, and that is important, like why basically uh, we need to deploy code securely and we need to embrace this kind of like a culture uh, within the space. So they, they, I think it's an ongoing kind of like battle. And also it's, it's something that Aave itself can't like be, uh, I mean, we, we just a part of like a bigger group. I mean, we, let's say for Aave, Centrifuge and all the projects in DeFi that are basically uh, following these best practices and embracing all of this uh, kind of like a uh, uh, stuff. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite tricky. Yeah, that's totally fair. And, and the other thing to consider is that not all damage is caused by nefarious activity. So while you do have your hacks, uh, we know what happened with KuCoin this week and, and all the other bad things that happen. A lot of times you have, you know, there, there's gamesmanship uh, in the lending and borrowing space. I mean, the whole invention of arbitrage uh, has to do with, with basically borrowing short, safe and lending long risky and just hoping you place the right bet. And, and so I appreciate that. And this is a great segue to Jason. So Jason, when you think about the, the centrifuge model, the, uh, the Lego, uh, you know, talk to me about the considerations that go into uh, pr protecting the ecosystem to, to let the asset back lending occur. Uh, and, and some of the, you, you know, how much rope do you let out to let developers develop versus how much do you try to draw some boundaries around stuff, uh, to, to, you know, to meet regulatory and compliance stuff down the road? You're muted. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah. So, um, I can answer that, but I want to shift the question slightly from regulatory and compliance to privacy because I think that's equally important and, um, and relevant to some of the guys here. Um, I wanna give an example. There's, uh, on one side you have a lending club loan and with a lending club loan, they do 4,000 loans a day. And when they upload those loans, they each loan has 75 variables. Things like FICO score, home, home or renter, uh, how many credit cards outstanding, all sorts of different variables. It's a data scientist dream, right? You get into this constant flow of new data to dive into and figure out like what's the best way to re-underwrite all the data. That's cool. That's like great data. Uh, and that's one way of doing things. On the extreme opposite side, you may have a Walmart that has an invoice with Sony, right? That has purchased a hundred thousand dollars worth of Sony equipment. Uh, there's no way that Sony, that Walmart wants to have that invoice show up on the blockchain. Not only do they not want the invoice to show up, they don't want Walmart to show up. So you have to do something really private there. That's what Baseline's doing with, with uh, that's what EY's doing with Baseline, where they're basically taking this precise proof and, and building this, uh, uh, well, Andrew can talk about it, but um, they're using CK proofs to, to do so. So from, so from Center Fuge's point of view, we have lots of different types of asset originators and they, some of them love to share lots of data. Others need to be extremely private with the types of data that they can share. We have to adjust to the type of asset originator and build, build around that. Um, we're, op we're building an open platform for decentralized lending, which means that once right now it's a two-sided marketplace with an investor and an asset originator, but give us a year or two and you're gonna see five, six, seven different parties coming together that can collectively weigh in on the asset, establish the risk of the asset, all online, all decentralized, and I'll ultimately get that asset funded. I think that's where we're going. And in some cases, we'll have a ton of data to work with. In other cases, we'll have very private data to work with. Even though we're using an open blockchain, we can do, we can do so with pri privacy as well. Mm -hmm. I, want, I want to stay on that, Jason. That's, that's a good point. So privacy and trust, I want to kind of move over to adoption. So these are all great ideas. And what's great about what each of you have called out is uh, it, it's not a stretch to imagine the future state. Like this is just, it, it's almost like, I feel like we're marching to some of the inevitability that you guys are, are working on. So, so Andy, you know, I'm gonna ask you about baseline and, and, and that aspect of it, but just broader question, is the greatest hurdle to adopting DeFi 
Is it trust? Is it technology? Is it some other X factor? And if it is trust, maybe use that to kind of talk about what you're doing to address privacy and, and what have you. Sure. Uh, I, I think uh, different different uh, segments of the market would answer that question differently, right? I think, you know, uh, retail investors up to this point uh, have sacrificed an enormous amount of, of privacy to use public blockchain uh, tools and applications, right? Now, there's some pseudo anonymity attached to it, right? But, you know, all my Bitcoin transactions, all my Ethereum transactions are are out there. And I'm, I'm willing to volunteer that information because I want to use this stuff, right? Because now there's there's an enormous amount of utility on it, um, and and frankly, there's 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 not that much risk because you know my my name and social security number and such aren't attached to it. Um, so I think the the risks for larger companies uh, are, are just very different, right? Um, one, they move slower. Uh, two, you know, data privacy and is a is if not the if not the top one of the top issues uh, for them right now, especially as you know jur jurisdictions around the world are sort of clamping down on you know uh, on data privacy, particularly if you're a, a business that serves you know uh, a, a, a retail customer base, right, and have a lot of you have to protect a lot of information. Um, so I think that's I think that that's certainly one thing that is 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 preventing them from adopting this um, and. We're really excited about the strides that have been made uh, in privacy over the last two years. When we first started experimenting with zero knowledge proofs um, to do private transactions on the on the public on the public chain, we were paying between eighty and hundred dollars a transaction. Which now for DeFi actually is, is, is you know uh, it's, it's funny <laughs> fees and fees have actually have, have caught up. Um, but but back then that was extremely expensive and it, and it's still not not scalable, right? So um, as as uh, proofing and batching technology has uh, improved over the last two years, that that privacy transaction cost has gone from you know eighty to one hundred dollars down to one to five dollars, right? And and there are strategies to get it below a dollar, below fifty cents, right? And so it, to me, it's not a question of if; it's just a question of when there is reliable, affordable privacy technology, and then um, applications can choose whether to just embed it natively in their app and that's the default or if you're a retail customer and you are more privacy uh focused then you can you know toggle a, a button and you can turn privacy on and maybe pay an extra five cents right mm -hmm. um you know ag aggregate that across a million customers and that's a pretty good pretty good revenue stream it's a little value-added service um so yeah we're, we're certainly excited about privacy i think that's gonna um it's gonna remove one of the risks uh, certainly for companies to start building on this platform. But I think the other thing that um, that they have to have is um, they need a toolbox too, right? Jason did a great job uh, analogizing uh, what's happening at DeFi to you know, money Legos. And um, there's a, an incredibly large toolbox now for engineers to, to plug and play and build different products and services, right? I mean, it, it, it will it's absolutely causing a a Cambrian explosion of, of new new finance in the market. Um, we are trying to build a similar toolbox for large large companies as well um, that don't just want to build financial services tools, but want to build you know enterprise process related applications, right? For things like invoicing and 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 procurement and and inventory management and, and things like that, right? So you're seeing this. I guess what you're seeing across the board, whether it's retail or 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 enterprise, is that you're you're turning the most common arrangements right whether they're financial arrangements b2b arrangements into standard software templates and you're giving those to engineers and saying here build the best solution that you can with these with these component parts right and the great thing about it is that it's all open source um, so anyone in the world that has uh, you know, developer skills can can plug and, and play these, and we're really excited about the the solutions that are going to come out of that. Nice, I appreciate that, Andy. And just a side note, I think ninety five percent of the species from the Cambrian explosion uh, ended up going extinct sometime later. But hey, those five percent were right <laughs> in the mix. Uh, poor, so, poor analogy. That's good. I like the, the Legos, but it is an explosion, uh, Adam. So the privacy. The, the trust, I mean, this has to be front and center with you. I mean, you're telling the big banks and everybody saying, hey, don't don't uh, share with Equifax 
here, we're all going to kumbaya together this data and see how it works. How do you take the, 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 the thing that people are most skeptical about with the trust and privacy and go into these big institutions and say, no, no, we got to figure it out. Yeah. So, so our typical sales point tends to be like a chief risk officer. The chief risk officer is interested in obtaining as much data and as much granular data as possible, plugging it into their models and trying to make better decisions. So the first thing we need to do is convince them that the applications that are built upon sort of our, the rails of effectively our information exchange will do just that, give them a lot more information than they could otherwise get. So that's number one. First consideration. I think the second consideration is, is it sort of regulatorily sort of compliant? Right. Um, so that becomes sort of the next layer, you know, from an adoption sort of perspective that we need to go through. And then the next two are really about info security, frankly, uh, and then and then sort of privacy. But I think the, the privacy elements are more about competitive response. Right. Which is if they are also sharing information, meaning they're not just acquiring information out of our network, but actually providing it because that's the way it works. Uh, in essence, they want to make sure that information that they, they cannot be weaponized from, let's say, a marketing perspective against them. Uh, because that is something you see with centralized data aggregators that create sort of mailing lists uh, that effectively are used by sort of competitors to compete for effectively the same customers. So um, from an adoption perspective, there are a slew of like, you know, um, considerations that, that um, financial institutions have. Privacy is just, you know, one of them. I'd say info security is another sort of big one, regulatory compliance, and, and then again, a sufficiency of, of underlying sort of data. So there's definitely, when we think about this, there's technology and there's adoption. The technology is super, super interesting, and there's so many folks doing really interesting things. You know, we're just one company within that. What we think is the, the big sort of divide is, you know, can you sort of drive sufficient, you know, adoption for large, from large institutions, right? And I think that is, that's the great challenge. Yeah. And, and I can imagine that that doesn't go away anytime soon. Uh, and especially every time some of these security challenges pop up, uh, you know, it's one more hurdle to climb or, or overcome. So, Stani, when you think about the folks that are engaged with, uh, with you know, with your platform, and, and I apologize, we only have another minute or so before the Q&A. Uh, what do you think your users feel about privacy and trust? Are they expecting you to provide it or do they take the onus on themselves to develop the protocols with the protections built in for their end users? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, you pretty much want privacy in, in sense from, from even the protocol layer because you don't want to expose much of the stuff. But I, but I think one important thing is that the, the public ledger has brought its like a lot of value in the sense that it democratizes uh, whatever is happening. If you look at uh, traditional banks, you don't see uh, the action there in, in the network. So definitely exposes into interesting uh, data, but the privacy is something that you actually, uh, it, it goes beyond that in, in the sense that users want privacy. I mean, you don't want to be tracked all the time uh, on, on blockchain, what you're doing, especially stuff like finance. You know, markets could be public, and to some extent, but you know, private uh, financial information uh, doesn't sound like a good idea to be public. So, yeah, <laughs> not at all. That makes perfect sense. So uh, we're we're at uh, five fifty Eastern time, and uh, welcome back, Peter, for kick off the Q and A. Okay, thank you. So, question here about regulation. Um, you know, on regulation, is there any country that is leading the way in creating a regulatory framework for DeFi? The U.S. does not seem that interested here. And so I, we just send it out to field. Does somebody want to field that? You want to raise a hand? I'm, I'm happy to sort of take a snap at this, which is I'm not sure what single country, you know, there are a number of countries that have created sort of regulatory sandboxes to basically encourage the adoption of, you know, either experimentation or adoption of nascent sort of technologies like blockchain or DeFi. And, you know, the reality is some of the smallest countries in the world are the most progressive. So I'm not sure, the, the, you know, who the most, uh, which country is the most, but certainly I'd agree with the, with the notion that the U.S. is definitely not a leader in encouraging sort of the exploration and adoption of these technologies by the regulated financial sort of sector. Um, but as we've seen in, you know, during the, the session yesterday with Brian Brooks at the OCC, there are definitely strides being made now 
where folks realize the power of some of this technology within the U.S. So certainly places like the U.K. and Singapore, you know, uh, you know, are, are, are much more advanced, frankly, than the U.S. Uh, in this in this regard. But the U.S. now finally has some some very educated and influential people who are, are very interested in seeing this type of technology get adopted. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, okay. I, would echo, I would I would echo that. I mean, we we um, follow U.S. based regulations. Um, we've designed our, our DeFi protocol with uh, U.S. regulations in mind. And um, while there's definitely areas that where there's just no laws, just never been considered in the law before, uh, there's there's certainly regulators and lawyers who are engaged, listening, and thinking about what, what to do um, in cases like that. So I feel perfectly comfortable talking to regulators about the uh, the – the processes and procedures, the you know the the situations that that I find where there's just nothing defined, and we, we need to kind of create something from from nothing. Right. Yeah, that's a great yeah. point. It, it's yeah, th this is a new technology, but it's not the first technology, and and so I think you just kind of overlay the existing adoption of of the internet and other recent technologies to this one, and we'll be in good shape. Right. Right. And I think I, I just just a follow up from that. I mean, Adam said this earlier about. Um, I think we were saying about consumer protection, and because right now, if 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 you if you see a scandal where there's a whole bunch of people lose a lot of money, that's when you know that that that's the biggest risk as I see it. Because if you have you know that's when the governments tend to overreact, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think you need to also look at it sort of beyond that, which is some of these technologies introduce vastly greater sort of security than exists in the current sort of system. And just to share sort of an anecdote that, that I always sort of find very, very amusing, um, you know, a large institution that we know sort of very, very well was looking at our sort of technology versus what they do with their underlying data with, you know, credit bureaus today. And their InfoSec folks were looking at our architecture and they were saying, well, you know, it's, a, you know, it's, it, it's um, you know, we're not sure whether we sort of want to get started with this after they sort of, you know, did sort of an audit. And we asked them to sort of compare sort of side by side, you know, you know, our info security sort of in our, in our architecture with what they are currently doing right. with their underlying borrower's data. And it was like like a 100x improvement with what we were doing versus what they do today with their underlying information. And that became the basis for like, there's nothing really to talk about, right? This is not a barrier. So you're absolutely right. Whenever there's a compromise of trust, you know, uh, regulators and adoption, you know, regulators focus for good reason, frankly, for consumer protection and adoption sort of slows down. But we also need to remember that some of these technologies confer vastly greater sort of security and privacy uh, attributes good point. than what exists today. Yeah, good point. Okay. And, and they de-risk. I will say this too, they also de-risk. I know from working with Jason and the Centrifuge and some of the background folks, there's more data being used to set pricing than in the traditional like shipping space so and i think with what andy's working on stani also we're actually de-risking the environment not you know not solving the world's problems but there's a little bit of a better uh, mousetrap and she's right. right okay and question for jason it looks like uh, here is is it as difficult to create a marketplace in DeFi as it sounds <laughs> that's a good one to end on this <laughs> Um, I don't think so. I think once you build, once you build the mousetrap, I mean, Stani can talk to this. Once you build the mousetrap, I'll, I'll let Stani answer this because he's just experienced it. We're just start, we're just at the, at the beginning of the curve. Stani's further down the curve and is experiencing incredible growth. So why don't you take this, Stani, on building a marketplace? Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> the incentives always drive I mean, one of the coolest thing about DeFi was, I mean, we started uh, roughly our first first protocol was in 2017 beginning, and there wasn't uh, stable coins in, in Ethereum. And once there was first stable coins, uh, USDC and DAI, uh, and once there's there was opportunities to yield, uh, earn something like five to seven, even to 10% on stable coins or even four, that a lot of attention. Uh, when you compare it to traditional finance and the yields there, uh, especially collateralized loans. And and then now that we have this different kinds of like, uh, uh, this kind of like bring your liquidity get incentivized further with the governance of these protocols, you know, that's a new incentive again, 
in, in the sense of the scale. So I think like uh, somehow incentives drive the whole space. And even though if, if, if they're not directly from Aave, like they might be from somewhere else and that drives the, the, the traction. And, and that's like uh, an interesting observation. Just to give some perspective for that question, Stani, where were you at the beginning of the year and where are you now in terms of assets on your platform? The beginning of the year, we started from zero, and now we have roughly 1.5 billion worth of uh, cryptographic assets in, in the smart contract. Uh, well, yes, there's my point. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, well, on that note, we'll have to leave it there. Gentlemen, I really appreciate uh, you sharing uh, sharing that, that uh, knowledge with us. I, I learned a lot on this panel, probably more than any of the other panel all afternoon. So thanks thanks a lot. Also, thanks to FICO for sponsoring this uh, this whole consumer lending track today. And uh, before we go, I, I've got a couple of other announcements here. We have overtime starting in about two minutes, lendit.com. Uh, slash overtime. If you uh, just want to talk about anything that you heard on the consumer lending track today, join us over there. Then um, we have coming up at the top of the hour, we have Networking Roulette, sponsored by the UK Department of Tr International Trade. Um, that new Networking Roulette is where you you just, it's it's like it sounds, it's a chance meetings that you, you, you get at these in-person events that you, we're duplicating here online. It's even better than that though, because you put in who you want to meet, and the algorithm matches matches with you. Okay, we also have our Lended FinTech All-Stars leaderboard, where we've got, we've had a lot of action today. There's been the five people that were leading this morning have all been knocked off, and there are now five new leaders, with Luke Powell, a longtime friend of Lended, uh, in the lead here. He's only got a pre, he's got a fairly narrow lead, so we very interesting to see what happens uh, tomorrow, but, uh, Keep doing those meetings. Keep asking asking questions. Keep meet, meeting with the, the in the solutions showcase with the sponsors, and you too can grow up that leaderboard. We'll see what happens tomorrow.